Good afternoon and welcome to a Navarra Media, the world transformed crossover um, at this virtual fringe. I'm Michael Walker. Today we are going to be discussing, I suppose, the big questions which surround this virtual Labour Party conference. What did Starmer's first six months as leader of the Labour Party tell us about what he actually wants, how he wants to govern the party, not how he won the leadership election? And after five years of controlling the party, are the Labour left in a position to influence the new leader at all? Or in terms of the party, at least, are they in the wilderness now? To answer that question, I have a stellar set of guests. Um, first of all, I have Dawn Butler. Dawn Butler is MP for Brent Central. Dawn served as a minister under Gordon Brown and after nominating Corbyn in 2015 to broaden the debate, went on to be one of the most valued players in his shadow cabinet. She is now one of Labour's most high profile backbenchers. Um, Dawn, it is a pleasure to have you back on Navarra Media. Hey, Michael. It's great to be back. <laughs> <Love> <laughs> are, you a, are you a regular at TWT as well? Um, I, I've done a fair bit. Though. Probably not as much as they want Do me to. So apologies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also have with me James Schneider. James Schneider was a founder of Momentum before going on to become Director of Strategic oh. Communications for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, in the warts and all accounts that have come out since Corbyn stood down as leader, James comes out relatively unscathed, um, which I think is owing to a general recognition that whilst many people in the Corbyn project fell through no fault of their own into roles they might have been ill-suited for, he was genuinely good at both communications and strategy. Welcome to the show, James. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I think that's and a bit too kind, but thanks anyway. <laughs> and finally, I'm joined by Patrick Maguire, who is a political reporter at The Times. And Patrick is now a Westminster insider and spent most of the Corbyn years at the New Statesman. He's the co-author of the recent Left Out, an inside story of the Labour Party since 2017. It's a gripping read, though if you are invested in the rows that raged at the top of the Labour Party over the last three years, it's not very relaxing, I will warn you. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon, Patrick. Thank you for having me. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> um, we are. It wasn't. You didn't advertise it as a relaxing read, so that's that's <laughs> fine. Um, we are going to start with a video because I am going to actually. First of all, I'll say I'm going to sort of divide um, this this conversation into two parts. So the first half of the show is going to be who is Keir Starmer, what does he want, and the second half is going to be how can the Labour left influence him or you know have influence within the Labour Party by whichever means we we are talking about. Um, so to kick off the who is Keir Starmer, I want to remind us how he, you know, the pitch he made when he won um, his position as, as Labour leader. This is his first campaign bid, which made waves um, when he first announced his bid um, to be leader of the party. In the struggles of the 1980s, the Labour movement stood together in solidarity against Thatcher. Keir defended the print workers at Wapping. He was in the crowd that night when police on horseback charged into the peaceful picket. He was there for the dockers in Dover in the P&O dispute, helping the families of strikers who had had their benefits cut off by the Tory government. He gave free legal advice to the poll tax protesters in Trafalgar Square. And in 1992, he stood up for my union, the National Union of Mine Workers. When the Tories closed the mines, we took them to court for failing to provide a just transition for workers. Keir stood in solidarity with workers and trade unions. Keir stood up for the protesters who were trying to stop the widening of the M3 and the destruction of the downland, when the full force of the state was against them. When Shell tried to sink the Brent Spa oil platform into the North Sea, Keir challenged this with Greenpeace to prevent an environmental catastrophe. For 10 years, he defended Helen Steele and David Morris when they were sued for libel by MacDonald. They fought all the way and won. And Keir defended me and many others to bring public scrutiny and awareness to the presence of the United States visiting forces so that we can live in a more peaceful and less secretive society. Keir never asked for anything in return, never sought to take the credit or make a name for himself. 
In 2003, he published a legal opinion in The Guardian that the invasion of Iraq would be unlawful and march with millions against the war. Keir took the last Labour government to court over its decision to deny welfare benefits to asylum seekers. I don't think anyone really expected someone who dedicated his career to defending workers, trade unions and activists to become Director of Public Prosecutions. Keir never forgot where he came from. As DPP, he stood up to the powerful. He had the courage to prosecute MPs for cheating on their expenses and to take on the Murdoch press for phone hacking. He prioritised changing prosecution guidelines on violence against women and girls, and he was instrumental in getting justice for Stephen. I was delighted when I saw Keir become a Labour MP in 2015 and so proud of the way he battled alongside Jeremy Corbyn against Tory Brexit and the Tories' plans to sell off the NHS. I've spent my life fighting for justice, standing up for the powerless and against the powerful. I still believe another future is possible where we can open up power and opportunity to all of our communities. We can confront the climate crisis with a Green New Deal we can promote peace and justice around the world with a human rights-based foreign policy. We can rebuild our economic model in place of the failed free market one. We can renew our democracy and spread power across all of our communities and halt the rise of racism and division across our country. Another future is possible for our party as well. We can put factionalism and division on one side and unify around a radical program where we can draw on the talents and strengths of all our members and supporters across the movement. Our party must move forward. There can't be any going back. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Together, we can and we will win. So I, I watched that again for the first, well, not for the first time, revisited it um, this morning. It still almost brings a tear to one's eye. You can see how the guy won the Labour leadership. That, along with his association with Remain, um, was the appeal, really. He was saying, well, unite the party. I'll bring forward um, the same activist spirit, really, that Jeremy Corbyn had, but whilst being competent and professional. Um, now he's won the leadership. Some people have seen or... or I think the message has changed, let's put it like that. So far from putting forward a, a radical agenda when it comes to the economy, Starmer has you know, not really taken a position on anything um, as yet. In terms of social movement, Starmer has been weak on Black Lives Matter and condemned direct action aimed at the Murdoch press. And well, I suppose you, you could see this as contrary to the, to the commitment to unite the Labour Party. He has sacked two high-profile socialist campaign groups Socialist campaign group members from his front bench, so Rebecca Long Bailey from the Shadow Cabinet and Lloyd Russell Moyle, um, who was a junior Shadow Minister. Um, Patrick, I'm going to start with you. I've obviously presented sort of a particular narrative there, and um, which is that Keir Starmer presented himself as left wing, and then when he became leader, turned out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. And his greatest achievement was, um, I suppose, to trick the left into thinking he was something that he was not. Um, am I being fair? Um, I don't think you're necessarily being unfair. I mean, look, there are two crucial things to analyse here. One is Starmer himself, um, and that video does give a sort of fairly comprehensive overview of his career and his politics, which those who know him in the 80s do say was sort of, you know, firmly to the left of the Labour mainstream. Uh, European red-green is how a lot of people put it, and I think in his heart, Keir Starmer undoubtedly still has those politics. But the crucial omission in that video, if you look at his biography, and by his own admission, this was a crucial episode. He, You have there, you know, the years of activist advocacy, and then he's DPP, and then he's Labour MP. The crucial episode Keir Starmer says in developing his thinking, and this actually sheds some light on... Um, you know the sort of uh, the sort of moral underpinning of this competency critique is he spent five years after the Good Friday Agreement as the uh, human rights advisor, advisor to the Northern Ireland Policing Board, and obviously the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the sort of you know um, uh, the occupying force of the Troubles, as many uh, as many nationalists saw it, um, was being reformed, turning the police service to Northern Ireland, and Keir Starmer was responsible for you know essentially telling this institution what it could and couldn't do and what it was getting wrong in terms of human rights. And I interviewed Keir um, during the leadership campaign in March, and he said that was a crucial point because he'd always been anti-police. He'd, he'd spent years and years pursuing individual cases against the police, and he got inside the PSNI, 
And then he said he found that actually things that would take years doing sort of pro bono legal representation for victims of police violence or whatever, he could do immediately, you know, if only the police could better exercise the power they had. And so that's sort of, if you tie that into what, what's happening now, you know, the, the government would be doing a better job if only it was, you know, if only you could do better. You're not questioning the, the underlying ethics or morality of, of policing in this case, or you know, you're not you're not questioning necessarily the the morality or ethics of the decisions the government is making. It's if you did it better, it would be um, the net impact on the public would be um, would be uh, less painful. So that's one crucial element. And the second element, to, to, uh, as you said, you know, did Keir Starmer convince people he was the candidate of say ideological and political continuity, um, and now he's you know representing a huge breach with the Corbyn years? Um, I say the crucial thing is regardless of what Starmer thinks about anything, look at the people who are around him. Um, you know, people like Morgan McSweeney, uh, David Evans. These are not people of the Labour left. These are not people whose careers in Labour politics have been spent trying to platform uh, left-wing voices in the Labour Party. Indeed, in the case of Evans and McSweeney, their, their whole mission, be it under Blair and be it during the sort of, um, you know, the, the years between the first leadership election and the 2020 leadership election, were thinking about how you marginalise the left. And it's true to say, um, you know, Morgan McSweeney's big thing is thinking about expressing things in terms of values and creating spaces where people who wouldn't necessarily agree on ideology can agree on sort of big picture issues, you know. And in a way, the whole point of the campaign, as people like that saw it, was to marginalise organised Corbynism or to, you know, dislocate the uh, the membership that was so supportive of Corbyn over the course of 2015 to 2020 from the sort of you know institutional moorings that sustain the left in power without necessarily without necessarily telling them that's what they were doing and i think on that count they've been very successful mm. i want to go to james um because you were i suppose an insider working with starmer for for a while for a long time when you were in lotto and he was brexit secretary or brexit shadow brexit secretary sorry um but then you went on to be sort of drafted in um to rebecca long bailey's campaign um, what do you make of his leadership compared to the Starmer you knew when he was in the shadow cabinet? Do you think that he has sort of visually changed from the outside? Do you think he he did sort of uh, make himself out to be more left wing than he actually was and that we're seeing a different Starmer now that he's become leader of the party? James, you need to unmute your microphone. Um, maybe I'm going to go to dorm while you work out how to unmute that. I Here we go. Done. Get, uh, we've got it. We've got it. Great. You heard my question, so Sorry. you can yeah, now yeah, you yeah. can now answer it. So I, I think he's he's leading in quite a similar way to how he was Brexit secretary, which is totally different to um, or sort of shadow Brexit secretary, which is is really rather different to that that campaign video. I mean, I, I obviously supported Rebecca Long Bailey as the left candidate. And I'd gone on a holiday in early January and I came back and I'd had my phone off for a week and that was lovely. But then I turned it on and basically the first thing I saw was this video. And it, it genuinely gave me nightmares because it's so good. And you watch that and you think, right, his appeal to the, 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 the party membership is absolutely pitch perfect. And true enough, it was. But I think we haven't heard any of that. So, I mean, I was just noting it down there, what, what made up the radical programme uh, in his video. Um, you know, rebuild the economic model. We've had absolutely none of that. They've run away from talking about wealth taxes or anything else. Green New Deal, there's none of that. Racism, well, you've mentioned the, the failings over Black Lives Matter. Uh, redistributing power and, and democratic reform, we have not had a peep out of that. And then human rights foreign policy, there hasn't, there hasn't been any. And so I, I think that, you know, what he has been effective at is uh, the, the management of the media has been has been very effective and hats off to him for that. And they are pursuing a coherent strategy and they are sticking to it. But I don't think we should be under any illusion that that strategy is a socialist strategy and it was never going to be a social strategy. It's, it is a strategy for uh, progressive social reforms. It's a strategy to have... Uh, nicer people running the government in the hope that they will run it better than the the current lot and of course they would do but it's not a strategy for social transformation it's not a strategy to confront the climate crisis it's not a strategy to transform the economy but you know on its own terms it's working quite well and uh, and I think we should you know we should be clear exactly what it is and not 
uh, not criticize it for not being what it was never going to be. Keir was never going to be the genuine, the, the candidate that he presented himself as, which is basically, look, you can have 80% of Corbynism, all the stuff you like, 80% of it, but it's just going to be more competent and more effective. You know, he, that was a great pitch for the membership, but we aren't going to have 80% of, of Corbynism from Keir. And that's fine, but we need to we need to understand that and then adopt a left strategy based on that, which isn't just saying, oh, my God, I can't believe he isn't doing the thing that we wish he was doing. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think there's some strong arguments. there. I think one way of putting it is that Keir Starmer put himself forward and say, what better way to sell a radical politics than to be someone who's knighted than to be a sir? And really, you can turn that around and say, if someone wants politics that radical, would they have been knighted in the first place? And I think we're kind of we're getting to the second part of, of that now. Um, I want to bring in Dawn now because we're sort of comparing Starmer or judging him compared to, to Jeremy Corbyn. You obviously had a, a key role um, in the shadow cabinet when, when Corbyn was leader, but you can also give us a longer term view um, of the party. You've been an MP under Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, not Ed Miliband actually, because you were out of parliament for those five years, and then Jeremy Corbyn. Where would you place, where would you place Keir Starmer um, on a left-right spectrum between those four leaders? Well, I think it's quite complicated. I think if you look at the video, as you said, it's quite emotional and you would plant Keir quite firmly um, to the left and it would be sort of full of hope. I think that the strategy, um, you know, and James has talked about it, if you like, from, you know, from his experience to how things are presented, I think that Keir's strategy to me is basically at the moment to to do nothing, to do very little, and to expose that the emperor has no clothes on, and so to reveal um, Boris uh, and the rest of his um, uh, merry men um, for their incompetence. And I think, and I think, in a way, that strategy has obviously to them been working because we are level pegging in the polls, but it's not going to. Take much further, I don't think now. So it needs to, the next steps now need to be implemented, and those next steps have to be around policies and directions and where we're going. And it has to be more. It can't just be about our values and and what we think. It's going to be. We've got Dawn. I'm going to interrupt you because we're having a few problems with your audio. Um, so we are actually. I'm going to sort of go ahead to our next clip, and then we're going to come straight back to you. And Fox will have sorted out your audio by then. Um, so we've sort of looked at how left wing Keir Starmer is. I've got a sort of more, I suppose, s surprising question now, one that I didn't realise I'd be asking six months after he became leader. How liberal is he? And again, I want to show a, a clip of the, the Starmer we knew before he became Labour leader. Um, so this is Labour Party conference in 2018. Um, and this is, I suppose, where Starmer puts himself forward as the Tribune of Remain, the Tribune of members in the Labour Party who feel you know, emotionally committed to the European Union. Let's take a look. If Parliament votes down the Prime Minister's deal, or she can't reach a deal, that is not the end of the debate. And Labour must step up again and shape what happens next. Our preference, our preference is clear. We want a general election to sweep away this failed government. And conference. Having swept them away, we want to install a radical Labour government capable of transforming this country. And that's what should happen after two years of negotiations ending in failure. But if that's not possible, we must have other options. And conference, that must include campaigning for a public vote. It's right that Parliament has the first say. It's right that Parliament has the first say. But if we need to break the impasse, our options must include campaigning for a public vote, and nobody is ruling out Remain as an option. And conference. And conference. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was going to come back that soon. Um, we're going to go straight to Dawn and see, see, see how your sound is doing now. Um, so the question I suppose I, I, I want to pose to you is, many people would have had doubts about is Keir Starmer going to be particularly left wing? I suppose one of the advantages I thought when, when he became leader, you know, compared to what came before. So say under Tony Blair, for example, you ended up with a Labour party that was incredibly authoritarian. Um, and, you know, in, in, in terms of the Iraq war, um, had no respect for international law. Um, or, or the human rights of people in 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 other countries. I thought with Starmer, at least he got a human rights lawyer. You know, he's, he's probably not going to do um, Tony Blair style things. And he did really pitch himself to Labour members as a liberal. Now he's going for a kind of social conservative angle. Um, and I want to know sort of what your thoughts are about that. How worried are you that he's going to go in a sort of blue Labour direction, which we might not have expected um, when he put himself forward to be leader? Um, I think. Can you hear me? Okay. You sound amazing now, Dawn. <laughs> um, I, think the, I think the key is going to be that um, we need to hold Keir to um, what he originally kind of promised and portrayed. Um, and I think that's vital and important. I mean, I don't know what his strategy in regards to his direction is. But what I do know is that um, we ha had a commitment to stick to the party's manifesto. And we cannot be outflanked by the Tory government. And at the moment, I feel in some policy areas, the Tory government are implementing policies that they are taking straight from our manifesto. And they're almost, if you like, more left than us as a Labour Party. And that would do us no good whatsoever. We will struggle. And we have to we have to, we can't just appeal to voters who never voted to us. We've also got to make sure that we keep the voters who are solid to us and our core beliefs um, as um, as a socialist party. And we shouldn't be scared of that. I mean, I did a, I did a conference uh, earlier today where they were saying, you know, we should sever our ties with the trade union. And, you know, the Tories said that. And I said, what a stupid, ridiculous thing to say. You know, and we need to start nipping all of this foolishness in the bud now. And Keir needs to be leading on that. And he just needs to be stronger on some issues. But as I was sort of saying earlier before, sort of my mic disappeared, I think Keir's strategy at the moment is to essentially do nothing and to just expose the emperor with no clothes on and to give himself a platform to be able to be heard, maybe in areas that they weren't listening to Labour before, which is cool. I can live with that. But we will need to start um, talking about you know, our policies and our core strategies and beliefs um, as a Labour Party. I want to um, get up now a quote from a Stephen Bush article, which is, um, and this is going to be thrown at, at James in a moment. So this is his his explanation of, of why Starmer is sort of going down the more Brexity, social conservative angle than we might have thought when he was in the shadow cabinet. So Bush writes, for Starmer and his inner circle, a more economically and socially liberal Labour might do better electorally, but it would be at the expense of the party's soul. Winning back seats Labour lost in 2019 and 2017 is not just about achieving power, but about what type of party it is. As one of his close allies put it to me, we're not the Democrats, meaning a loose coalition of social liberal liberals, big city progressives and some trade unions. Labour is a party of the Labour interest of working people in the trade union movement. It is the Labour Party's desire to revive that historic identity that distinguishes it both from its recent Corbynite past and its electorally successful new Labour days. It's not just victory Starmer aims for, but to save Labour as we know it. Um, now, when I read that, I sort of thought of you, James, because I was just imagining you kind of pulling your hair out, um, actually, <laughs> because I think I think this could have been written about many people in the leader's office when Corbyn was leader. And one of the main reasons they sort of travelled away from that kind of positioning was that Starmer was dragging them in a different direction. So I kind of wanted to get your your response to what do you see as, as Starmer's strategy being described in these terms now? Yeah, I mean, that's rubbish. I agree with Dawn that the, the strategy is a sort of win by default strategy and, and that could win electorally. Um, I actually don't think the, the, the strategic social conservatism uh, is that weird relative to the hard remain. If you think what was hard remain, continuity remain, it was, a, uh, it was mainly or in large part, it was a professional managerial class project. Uh, most of the people that were the leading figures of the People's Vote campaign within the, the, the hard remain, continuity remain um, with, uh, within the media and so on, that's, the, that's that sort of class formation. And you know, the, I, the reason why I call it strategic social conservatism that he's following is because it's clearly not heartfelt. It's clearly not believed. 
it's a, it's a strategy to manage a group of people who you don't really have very much to offer to. And, and it's, again, that scene that, that reads to me as a kind of professional managerial class strategy rather than the sort of strategy that Stephen Bush was outlying there, which is actually substantially similar to what, um, you know, quite a lot of what the, 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 the Corbyn strategy was, which is to try to prevent the cleavage within the working class majority in Britain that we are seeing animated by uh, by culture wars and by Brexit, but to do so not by strategically moving to the right and not by saying nothing and allowing the Conservatives to constantly drag the spectrum further and further to the right, but finding other grounds to unite people on a Green New Deal, on a radical economic message, on redistribution, on, t on reducing inequality, on taxing the rich and so on. And I think I, I, I think that um, th that briefing that's been given seems quite dishonest to me. Um, Patrick, I want to go to you. Um, and I suppose my question now is there's, there's a number of ways you can interpret this because people who, who are very supportive of Keir Starmer, so someone like Paul Mason who sort of comes on the show, they say, look, he, he might not look left wing from what he's saying to the public, but I know the guy he is. And he's just saying what he needs to say to win Labour a majority. And so the idea would be that ultimately, you know, he's he, he he's not an opportunist. He he sort of has these core values and they are left wing. But what he wants to do is say whatever is necessary to get elected and then implement something a bit more radical. And, you know, from your conversations that you have in Westminster, do you think there's any truth to that? Or should we take Keir Starmer at his word when he basically suggests he wants to be, you know, a more competent version of and it's got an establishment prime minister who's more competent than the current incumbent, let's put it like that. Well, well the argument um, people around Keir Starmer make is essentially the one. Uh, Dawn hits the nail on the head when she says it's essentially do nothing, win back a degree of trust among voters who, for whatever reason, have emerged from the past five years or longer, um, not wishing to give the Labour Party a hearing. And then once you have, I don't know what the metric for measuring this is, but once you feel you have won their trust back, then you can start making economic arguments, right? That 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 is why Labour's tax policy is essentially, it's not for us to have a tax policy until 2024, because people around Keir Starmer feel that they don't have the credibility that Labour's brand is not strong enough to be uh, advancing economic arguments. Um, and but, but sort of what Keir Starmer thinks is sort of secondary to this question. And it, it comes back to the idea of pressure. You know, you look at recent interventions from, you know, people like Andrew Fisher and the stuff uh, Dawn and James have been saying, it's all about sort of maintaining pressure on Starmer to maintain the 10 pledges to advance the econo economic arguments he said he was going to advance. But that is not going to be the only source of pressure. And you look at the MPs on the front bench, you know, there are 10, maybe now 10 or nine or 10 campaign group MPs on the front bench, mostly in junior positions. Obviously, you have momentum, you have um, the unions that aren't supportive of Keir Starmer. But if you look at sort of the key briefs related to um, the the key pledges of stuff, you know, human rights based foreign policy, or, you know, a more dovish foreign policy, um, the economic radicalism, do, I mean, does anybody really think that a Treasury front bench that includes that by majority, you know, people like Pat McFadden, Wes Streeting, Bridget Phillipson, a a uh, foreign affairs front bench that has, um, you know, Wayne David and Stephen Doughty, and then you have the home uh, the Home Office with Holly Lynch and Conor McGinn. You know, all people from a Labour tradition, but it's not the Labour tradition that would make the ten pledges that Keir Starmer made. Um, and so those, you know, those policy teams really going to be agitating for the ten pledges, or are we going to be moving to a traditional, more sort of traditional sort of Labour right territory, um, because they were the big winners of the first front bench. Um, and if you look at the remaining MPs who voted for airstrikes on Syria, the 29 that are left, you know, I think a majority of them now have um, positions on the front bench. So I don't really see, um, even at the point where it comes to decide, you know, the leadership comes to decide what arguments is going to advance, that the pressure in the PLP is not going to be brought to bear in such a way that um, it's not going to, even if, you know, it's the 10 pledges by any other name, they're not going to be the, you know, the spirit of those 10 pledges or the letter of those 10 pledges. I don't think it's going to be quite as strong as it was in, uh, intended to be in January 2020. Do you think Keir Starmer's a signpost or a weather vane? So, you know, politicians are often divided into, do they just follow, go with the wind? Do they just allow themselves to find themselves in, the, you know, the equilibrium between different sorts of pressure or do they stand by what they believe and try and change political reality? 
Um, well, obviously, I think that the strategic choice that's been made now is to present him as um, a weather vane, so that the so that then you might direct voters to the signpost that said sort of that says sort of uh, you know uh, you know strong social democratic platform here. Um, mm. But it depends, you know, if you are allowing yourself to spin it in a direction that a critical mass of the PLP and a critical mass of your front bench like, then how do you put that genie back in the bottle? You have to be very, you have to be very assertive, um, and maybe you know his mandate is as such that he can be. But you know, it's a, it's a risky. There's not much risky, evidence that that's the plan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look. Basically, the, the problem is much of the PLP agrees sincerely with the stuff he's saying strategically. Is part of the problem. Um, Dawn, I want to go to you because it seems like we're going to move into our next phase of the conversation because it seems like there's there's actually relative consensus that Keir Starmer isn't particularly left wing. Um, you know, not not that he's a, a you know an evil Blairite who's trying to regain the party so he can invade a Middle Eastern country, but someone who who doesn't have many commitments to you know the kind of left wing vision that that Jeremy Corbyn had and many Corbynite members with many people who traditionally go to the world transformed. So we're gonna we're gonna move on to pressure. How can left wingers pressure um, Keir Starmer to take different positions? Um, and probably the most obvious place that uh, a leader has problems with people who might oppose their positions is in Parliament, is the PLP, the Parliamentary Labour Party. Um, Dawn, um, you know the MPs, you're there, you're one of them, you sit among them. Um, the impression I get from the outside is that, you know, Keir Starmer at the moment is completely unassailable. It seems like the, the MPs predominantly are just incredibly relieved um, to have a leader who they see as, you know, more of one of them. And um, the civil wars of the Corbyn era are over. And, you know, Keir Starmer looks quite untouchable. Would you agree um, with that analysis? Do you know what? Like, I think it comes down to sort of discipline. Um, you know, I actually think that sort of those of us, you know, people like to say those of us on the left, I actually think that we actually are really quite disciplined and have the party's best interests at heart. You know, when Jeremy was leader, you had, you know, everybody kind of carping in the background, getting in the media, getting mad, attacking him, you know, and kind of destroying the Labour Party from within. And that's not sort of what the majority of us are about. And so I think actually that we've shown, we, you know, that we've shown complete um, discipline and should be given credit for that. And how do we make our voices heard? I think is by um, ensuring that... Um, we do media. Uh, we can't be afraid of doing media. I mean, there are very few sort of MPs kind of from the shadow cabinet doing media at the moment. And I think, you know, they are they are being very, very sort of closed. But I think a lot more of us need to sort of do media um, and talk about Labour's values and, and where we're going, because we are a broad church, as they like to say. So you cannot exclude um, one uh, section of the party or because I think we have to it has to boil down to policies what are our policies what is our strategy what do we want the country to look like you know we need to be talking about post-covid now when we come out of lockdown what will the country look like you know we we're, we are facing um, uh, we are facing uh, austerity like we've never seen before and we are facing uh, a huge threat of no deal Brexit, that is going to have a devastating effect on the majority of the country, even in areas where people voted for Brexit. So we need to start laying down our ground now and saying, look, this is what Labour's, Labour is about. And, you know, come and talk to us, come and join us. And we can't just wait for that to happen because the fear is, you know, the strategy is okay at the moment, but if you if you wait too long, there'll be a tipping point and then people still won't listen to us. So you, you've got to get it quite right. I asked on what your red lines would be. And what I mean by this is, I suppose the PLP have a fair degree of power in that they can go on the television and trash the leader. This happened all the time under Jeremy Corbyn. You don't strike me as someone who's in a rush to do this. You don't strike me as someone who just wants to attack the leader for the sake of it. But are there any policies or any positions that you can imagine Keir Starmer taking where you would you know, be straight on the phone to BBC or Channel 4 and say, I want to come on your show and say that what Keir Starmer has done is wrong and that he, you know, should watch his back fundamentally. So, I mean, you know, Michael, you know, like my first priority is to get a Labour government and, you know, and I think, you know, Labour government is way better than any Tory government will ever be and that will always be my first priority. 
I do think at the moment that care and each other cabinet, you know, many of them could be much stronger in areas around Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, I think they could be stronger around that. I can think they could be more aggressive in regards to the government's incompetence and their handling of the pandemic. And, you know, we need to remind people that the government is responsible for where we are now because of their lack of action. You know, there is obviously the argument for, you know, showing that the emperor has no clothes, giving them enough rope to hang themselves, as they say. There is, you know, an element of that. But let's, you know, let's go out there and say, well, actually, you know, take the fight to the Tories. I kind of, you know, I miss, I miss the fight, if I'm honest with you. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, you know, we can be taking the fight to the, it's a wide open goal. I mean, you know, in fact, you know, Boris has been so incompetent. He's not enjoying the job at all. He's complaining that he's losing money every single day. He's not getting enough money. You know, we could be 20 points ahead, really. You know, pe people used to say the problem was Jeremy. Now we've got somebody that people consider to be prime ministerial, competent. Um, you know, he does, you know, fairly well at PMQs. It's not setting the world alight and exciting, but it's stable. So, you know, let's let's edge it a bit more. I mean, let's get 20 points ahead. Let's not be just, oh, yeah, we're level pegging. The government's seriously incompetent. <laughs> We've had enough of strong and stable. You want to go on the attack? <laughs> the government's take the fight to the Tories. I want to go to James and stick on the topic of the PLP because yep. obviously, I suppose, you, you spent a lot of time trying to manage malcontents and within the PLP who were, I suppose, either trying to undermine the leadership for its own sake or trying to drag the policy direction in a particular way. Um, I suppose one one legacy of Corbynism is that there are more left-wing MPs than there were before. So the Socialist Campaign Group used to be, I don't know, 10, 15 people. There's now 34 people in it, which is sort of the official block of left-wing MPs. And we can talk about opposition, but also if Starmer were to become prime minister, if, if, if his appeal or his strategy, which we've all said is you know, reasonably successful to make himself seem prime ministerial to the population, if he gets into that role, you could have these 34 MPs being real linchpins in terms of, you know, they could, they could cause defeats. Um, my concern would be, do they seem well organized enough? I mean, I haven't really heard much from those 34 MPs in the campaign group. And how much trouble do you think they would be able to cause for a prime minister Starmer who was trying to shift the party to the right? Um, so I'm not going to answer your question because I think it's the it's the wrong one and it's the wrong focus that we have. I think because we've, Fine. Uh, I mean, I, I'm respectfully, but I, <laughs> I, I I think that we need to, as a socialist strategy and uh, thinking of all of the socialist resources that we have, which are, you know, are, are quite decent, um, we need to get our heads out of Westminster. We need to get our heads out of the corridors in Normanshaw South. The, the, the front bench, Lotto, because I think we're still slightly stuck there and thinking that we're able to negotiate with what has replaced us in a way that we can't, you know, we can't really. And they, you, they will be able to if Starmer's in power, right? I mean, they, but, if, but, if they're in I power mean, with low-levering MPs, they will have proper leverage. I mean, perhaps, but how they would actually have proper leverage is if we change the, the ground around the party and also around... Uh, around the government so by that i mean uh if we were if, if there are real campaigns in the country like black lives matter but also like the tenants movement now against the evictions those are the things which are going to shift uh, uh shift the political weight in this country shift what is what is possible and then change the ground that the leadership stands on and also strengthen the hand of those 30 odd um, socialist campaign group MPs. And I also think not having just the focus on the MPs and, and, and Parliament alone means that we're in a better position to have a strategy which is don't carp, build. We've got quite a lot of uh, socialist resources across, yes, some uh, in Parliament, across momentum in the grassroots and in the trade unions and in the whole galaxy of movements and organisations that are that are progressive in this country. And I think rather than just try to focus narrowly on, on Westminster, we should be trying to unite those as much as possible into as formal an alliance that can then 
uh, campaign and put forward the kinds, you know, the kinds of arguments that Dawn was, Dawn was saying, you know, what do we want to see in the post-COVID world? How are we re responding to, to climate change? What are we doing about the coming eviction crisis for tenants? And I think that's a far more effective socialist strategy uh, for, for both changing the party, but also changing society, because you're doing both at the same time. And I think that's where our focus should be, rather than in thinking that Keir is basically our guy, maybe, or he's not really our guy, but if we push him a bit this way, he'll do more our thing. I think, no, the world is in huge flux, the, you know, um, the, and how it's going to settle down in two years' time, nobody knows. We need to be an organised socialist force that is trying to remake that world to have enough socialist possibilities. And I think that is the way that we influence Keir, that's the way we influence a future Labour government, and that's how we influence this government as well, this U-turning government that doesn't have a clue what it's doing either. And I think that is a far more coherent socialist uh, social strategy than fixating on whether we should get more of our MPs to criticise the leadership on this issue or that. I don't think it's about, I think it's about leverage, right? So it's if, if Keir Starmer is in government, they are going to have a lot of material power to change policy, not do we want Ian Lavery to shout at Keir Starmer this day or that day? Well, I mean, I, I, th I think the material power is if there is a national tenants movement, for example, that is able to take serious action to insist on a particular, you know, a particular policy. Let's say Labour goes into the next election with most of the housing policies from the last manifesto, or even just half of them. In order for those to, you know, Keir's strategy seems to be if you have better people in governments, they will be able to do good things. That is not what has happened in history basically ever, because the forces of reaction, the forces of capital, the forces of the establishment shift the government, drag the government to the right. It is only if you have a government which is there and is open to an array of progressive forces, of trade unions, of various social movements that are strong enough to force through the kinds of progressive policies that we want. And so I think our strategy, our social strategy, it has to be strengthening those progressive forces as much as possible, because that is what we will need to get decent policies from any government. You've gone full circle, James. Sorry. Three years in Westminster and now you're all social movements again. <laughs> um, Patrick, I want to go to you for, for an insider take um, on, on Keir Starmer's team. What do you think they're scared of? Not from, not from the Conservatives. What are they scared of from the Labour left or from forces to their left within society? Where are they under pressure? Um, I mean, to be blunt, I think if you, asked, um, if you asked them that question, the answer would probably be some variation on not very much. Um, and at the risk of going back into Westminster, I think that's because they've calculated that um, the Labour left is something of a busted flush. You know, they have, in their view, divided and ruled. They've won that big mandate. Um, and they have won the right to ignore whatever argument um, any bit of the left is making at any one time. That isn't to say they might disagree or agree with those arguments, but they think their internal position is strong enough that, for now at least, you know, pending the results of the Gen Sec elections or the NEC elections, they have sort of free reign to basically ignore a left that either carps or seeks to build. The interesting thing about what James just said is the sort of thing Keir Starmer was saying in 1986, 1987, um, when he was writing for, uh, you know, obscure pamphlets. And, you know, he was very much of the sort of Hillary Wainwright view of, you know, you unite the disparate fragments of liberation politics as they were then, not necessarily what James is saying now, and, you, you know, they cohere into a bigger, broader based movement in the country. Um, and that is what powers a genuinely representative Labour Party and unites the progressive forces in British society. But that isn't necessarily what they're trying to do now. But to answer your actual question, um, are they scared of anything? I think they're scared of um, left wing front benches or left wing uh, activists in the Labour Party being seen as, you know, Dawn saying, let's get the camp campaign group on television now. The campaign group is better organised than it has been, you know, I'm still quite wet behind the ears, but, you know, it, it's a sort of, you know, much more public facing organisation in this parliament. That's a constant decision that's been made. Um, but, you know, I think if, that if anything scares them, it's being seen to take left wing positions at this point or being seen as the party of, you know, say Dan Carden goes on television tomorrow and says, yes, I'm for wealth taxation. Yeah, that's the, the thought of a, a front bencher, even though there's campaign group front benches on the front bench. Um, 
you know, I think that scares them. Hence why they're so keen to shut these discussions down. Hence why, you know, you had Annalise Dodds saying we should look at wealth taxation. You had Starmer saying it something, you know, a sort of diet version of that on LBC. And then within a couple of days, the position was we don't talk about tax until 2024. Thanks very much. Um, so if anything scares them about the left, I think it's the left, Labour left being seen to publicly exist as an integral part of the Labour Party, not mm. necessarily any of the positions they take. So they're just worried about the Labour left embarrassing them, essentially. Because they, they could always just, in that scenario, sack Dan Carden as well, right? They've shown they're very willing to, to sack um, left-wing front benches if they see them as an embarrassment. Yeah, but, I, I, you know, it's... You know, the, 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 the sort of, you know, the strategic decision Starmer's campaign made was to embrace, you know, the Corbynite left, or at least the, um, you know, the bit of it they could live with. Um, what as an integral part of the Labour tradition and presenting Keir as the inheritance of that tradition. Now it's about saying, well, hang on, there's only one legitimate source of policy thinking within the Labour Party now, and it is the Leader of the Opposition's Office and the Shadow Cabinet. Um, you know, and if you... So that, that, is, that, is, the, that is the sort of the, the pinch point, as it were. He wouldn't allow the kind of freelancing that he did as Brexit Secretary. Is Absol one absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> You know, post uh, a gamekeeper. We're going to look at, we've got one last clip for you. And this is an example, I think, of Keir Starmer oversteering. Um, so obviously, his, he took a knee for Black Lives Matter. Then Black Lives Matter came out wanting to defund the police. This made him a little bit terrified um, that he could get tarred with the defund the police Black Lives Matter brush. And this was the save he tried to, to make. Let's take a look at him talking to the BBC earlier in the year. That's nonsense. Um, and um, nobody should be... Um, saying anything about defunding the police. I mean, and I would have no truck with that. I was director of public prosecutions for five years. I worked with police forces across England and Wales, bringing thousands of people to court. So um, my support for the police is very, very strong and evidenced in, in the actions I've, joint actions I've done with the police. There's a broader issue here. The Black Lives Matter movement, uh, or, or moment, if you like, internationally, is about reflecting something completely different and it's reflecting um, on what happened dreadfully in America just a few weeks ago um, and showing or acknowledging uh, that as a moment across the world and it, it's it's a shame it's getting tangled up with these organizational issues um, with the organization Black Lives Matter but I, don't, I wouldn't have any truck uh, with what uh, the organization was saying about defunding the police or anything else that's just nonsense. So when, when Keir Starmer said that, there was, there was some pushback initially because he'd, um, I suppose no one really expected the Labour leader to say they were in favour of defunding the police, but because he called it nonsense, people thought it was overly dismissive. But it was mainly this line, that it was a Black Lives Matter moment um, that pissed people off. And why I think this is interesting, Dawn, is, is not just that he said that, but this actually seems like one of the one situations where he did get a bit uncomfortable, he did end up having to come out and say, oh, actually, I regret saying that. I regret calling it a Black Lives Matter moment. Um, what I meant is it's a defining moment. I think he had to rewrite history because I'm pretty sure he went out there to try and distance himself from the movement. But the pushback scared him. Um, and I wonder what your analysis is of, of that series of events. Why was it that in that particular situation, Keir Starmer had to roll back on what he'd said? Do you think he is genuinely worried that he could lose, well, votes and popularity among young voters, ethnic minority voters, etc. cetera. Do, do you think we can see a glimmer of his um, responsiveness to people to his left in, in that particular sequence of events there? So this is why it's important that we keep him honest, right? Because um, if we were to lose, for instance, uh, the black vote or the young vote or the progressive vote, uh, then we will lose many, many seats, more seats than we will gain. So this is why we have to keep um, the party honest uh, from its core. And, um, you know, what Patrick said uh, hurt a little bit. Ouch. Um, <laughs> but um, but he may think or, you know, the, the shadow cabinet may think that uh, they'll be embarrassed by um, seeing the left on TV, if you like. But actually, um, when you think about the policies that from the 2017 and 2019 manifesto, the Conservative Party are taking policies from those manifestos. And I think it's important that we recognise that because come the next election, we will need to have some policies, but we have to be mindful that you know, a lot of our policies would have been stolen, which is fine. 
because you know they're great policies they're not they're not done to the whole realm of of what we need to be done in society but we you know we kind of all need to read the room in terms of where we're going politically so i think it's absolutely vital that um we do organize and mobilize like james was saying as well because without our unlike the tory so it could it, it could be fine on paper saying we want to present ourselves this way as a political party but without our activists on the ground we will not win an election because we will have nobody to deliver leaflets and knock on doors we are not the tory party we don't have you know millionaire funders who have been made richer can i say some may say controversially by the amount of money that they've been getting from procurement contracts from dominic cummings and uh, boris johnson so they've been made richer and they will have lots more money to pile in to the next general election so actually we cannot abandon our base and we cannot abandon our heart of the party and the core of the party because that would be a huge mistake uh, we're going to go to some questions in a moment so start putting your questions in the the comments and i think i'm going to do it in a kind of quick fiery way we're going to get everyone up on screen to do that it might be chaotic uh, that's what i'm hoping um i want to bring in james schneider before i do that because you know i've been talking about your response which is basically you know real change happens on the streets in social movements and then you just pressure a political party which is basically seen as something separate um to to move into that space or you i suppose to to cut the question short what's the point in people being in the labor party in that vision because I know there was sort of an idea when Corbyn was leader that you'd have this thing called a movement party where social movements and the Labour Party would unite into this social force and you'd have the leader of the Labour Party as you know, almost leading social movements. If you're seeing them as purely external and applying pressure on, on the Labour Party from which you shouldn't expect that much, why should people remain members of it? I'm not suggesting that people should be outside the party at all. I mean, I think that we should... Uh, as part of the bringing together of those socialist resources, m let's face it, the overwhelming majority of them lie within the Labour Party. And that is that's a potential source of strength. So when I'm saying bring bring forces together, I mean, quite concrete things like a formal alliance with some kind of coordinating committee between the socialist campaign group MPs, the left led trade unions at, or the left of the unions that are not uh, left led momentum and perhaps uh, some other groups to provide some coherence and coordination uh, and direction for the left as uh, for the left as a whole and that sort of that sort of body would then be much better placed to engage with the parts of the movement which sit half outside half inside the the labor party i mean obviously lots of activists in uh, in trade unions, in uh, tenants activists, Black Lives Matter activists, uh, climate change activists, XR activists, so on. Quite, you know, a, a good bulk of activists in all of those movements are in the Labour Party, and that is, uh, you know, that is a source of strength. So I'm not arguing for um, the kind of thing that Patrick was suggesting that Keir was arguing for in in the middle late 80s of a kind of airy if everyone comes together we'll 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 pressure the politicians but let's not sully ourselves by getting involved i'm not saying that but i'm saying the the party is not just uh what happens along two or three corridors in westminster the party is uh over half a million people in every community in the country in every workplace in the country and we should start viewing it more like that and i think it's from there that we will um that we will get our strength all right. Can we get up? For, can we get everyone up on screen while we do some quick fire questions from the audience? Is that possible? Are we gonna, yes. This, this is what I wanted. Right. First question. Um, I suppose you can sort of you know move your head a bit if you want to answer it. Does Starmer have a class analysis? Who's going for it? Yep, James. Go on. Uh, not in uh, a way that would be capital and labour, and uh, I, I don't think so. I mean. Uh, they, of course, they, they look at voter groups and you can see that in his head of policy, uh, Claire Ainsley's work, and they've got an idea of particular types of working class and the remake of working class, but it doesn't seem to fit into a kind of uh, a coherent um, class analysis that would come out of, um, you know, a, a Marxian tradition. So. Um, and our next question, did Ed Miliband become leader 10 years too soon? Dawn. Um, 
I think that's probably based on people seeing his performance the other day in Parliament and they were like, they got excited because they're like, yes, that's what an opposition uh, is like. And I think that's kind of based on the fact that, you know, people have been missing um, that type of opposition. Um, I, um, no, I don't. Um, I mean, I wasn't there under his leadership, as you know. So I don't know if he became a leadership too soon. But I think people miss him now because he, he performed really well at the dispatch box the other day and sucked it to, to Boris. And really, that's what people like to see. A follow-up for, for Patrick, I suppose. Is Ed Miliband now the most left-wing member of the Shadow Cabinet? <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, there's, certain, there's certainly an argument for that. I mean, a lot of people are very... Uh, there's, um, you know, whispers that uh, Lotto are quite worried about Ed Miliband and his willingness to, you know, talk about actual ideas in public. Um Okay. Yeah, there's some, there's some suggestion of a degree of a degree of jealousy at the the plaudits Ed Ed received um, earlier in the week, and obviously if you have you know Ed is someone with a, a fully formed um, idea of how an economy should work, is thinking deeply and often out loud about what the economy should look like after COVID. Um, so there is you know potential for a little bit of tension there, particularly with. Um, Someone like Annalise Dodds, who obviously uh, was, you know, uh, thought widely and, and deeply when she was in John McDonald's Shadow Treasury team, but um, is now, you know, quite solidly holding the lotto line of not saying very much at all. So, you know, watch this space. But I think, yeah, basically, um, if you're judging, maybe not, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, what's in what's inside, but in terms of what he's willing to say out loud, yeah, certainly. Um, Lucy asks, what sort of policies can we expect from the Labour Party come the next election? I mean, I suppose the background there is they're not, you know, they've said we're, we're waiting until 2024 to announce our policies. If you've got a crystal ball in front of you, what what do you think the platform's going to be? James, go on, you blinked. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it would be quite um, stripped down, probably. Uh, not, not necessarily because they want to move hugely to the right, although I think there will be um, various policies that are ditched. But I think... Um, uh, so his head of policy, um, who seems who seems very influential, Claire Ainsley, who, if it's the same as um, under us, would be in charge of writing the manifesto. Um, you know, her background is is more in comms than in policy. Like Andrew Fisher's was more in policy than in, in comms. So I imagine it would be more written as a political document rather than the outcome of policy development over several years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of agree. But can I just say on that, like? If we don't have anything that inspires people, nobody will vote Labour. So it wouldn't, it won't matter what the polling say. And I think ultimately, you know, we need to get to that point, um, which yeah, we have got a few more years to go. But you know, it does, it does worry me because you know, as shadow cabinet members, we all had enormous input into what was written in our briefs, and I think, uh, I, I think um, that's probably not the same at the moment. And also from a, from a sort of you know, Westminster Village perspective, if I can, you know, solid the conversation with this again. You don't have to apologise every time, Patrick. That's why we uh, got you uh, here. Uh, thank you. Um, but, you know, <laughs> just sort of bluntly in terms of media management, obviously um, there are any number of reasons why Keir is getting a better hearing um, from the mainstream media. But, I mean, look, if you just carry on saying nothing after a while, people get bored. It will just become boring. Like, you know, already colleagues in the lobby are saying, you know, when is Keir going to say something? You know, you can sort of... You know, maybe maybe the maybe the idea is that you know when he does make an intervention, it carries so much more weight. But you know, much longer. If this carries on for much longer, I think there'll be less of an appetite, as Dawn suggested earlier. You know, you have a very narrow window in which you can be heard. There's only so long Keir can be not Jeremy. Um, and you know, obviously, the, the the new leadership slogan is is taking that to the nth degree and stringing that out a bit more. But I, I won't be long before questions start to be asked about, you know, where's the beef? Um, so. That's another thing to bear in mind. Mm. Where's the beef in terms of sort of like where's the meat instead of where's the, the rouse? <laughs> yeah, where's the beef in the sort of uh, what Walter <laughs> famously said to Gary Hart in the 1984 Democratic campaign. Um, Holly Peacock has a good question. What would the impact be of proper left political leadership arising outside of the Labour Party? Um, which I kind of want to furnish with, I think, a... Uh, a, a different well a, a very similar question which i think arises from it is is the one thing that could fit that could sort of scare keir starmer is a sort of corbyn led third party you know say they sort of expel someone who's really seen as a shibboleth and then there is a bit of an exodus could there be a, a party which obviously is not going to win government but could be a wrecking operation 
I'm not. I'm not suggesting it. I'm just saying that could. You know, is this something that Keir Starmer should fear? I'm. I'm not sure it will suit us in in regards to the ultimate goal, which is um, getting into government. And I think we should kind of ensure that that um, is part of our focus. But it, I mean, it does. You, you. It does seem as though you know there will need to be some prodding, let's say, at certain times uh, of the current leadership and you know that prodding should be welcomed i think that was quite good actually <laughs> yeah welcome <laughs> prodding james you know corbyn best what's he going to do next well he's definitely not going to set up a, a splitter wrecker operation i can tell you that for that that for certain um i mean jeremy is uh, he's campaigning uh, already on the issues that uh, that he cares about he's not getting involved in uh, internal party fights and rows, as you can see, but, you know, he's he's very active, especially on international issues and uh, and on justice issues, and, and he will be forever. Rick, I'm going to do the, the, the final question on you as an insider perspective. This is, I think, lots of people's fears. In the next four years, can you imagine a purge? So either of left-wing members or of left-wing MPs? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, there are certainly, I, 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 to, to be fair, I don't think you know, obviously, the 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 dream of people on, uh, you know, the the you might call them the hard right of the Labour Party. If we're going to invert the you know classic uh, Westminster lexicon, um, the dream is that the EHRC report drops on Starmer's desk, or you know, it's already dropped on his desk, and for some reason, despite it being a sort of you know uh, a statutory body, for some reason, the recommendation is expel Jeremy Corbyn and the whole campaign group. I mean, to, I don't think anybody. Um, in Keir Starmer's operation wants that, thinks it's a good idea, or, um, you know, is expecting that as much as, you know, people on the outer rungs of his supporters might think that's a good idea. Um, it depends how you define purge. I mean, obviously, we'll see, you have to see what, the, see what the Ford inquiry says, ultimately, and what sort of pretense that can be used for. Um, you know, it's, you know, there'll be people around Jeremy Corbyn who, Sam Moore, uh, not Jeremy Corbyn, Keir Starmer, you know, Rachel Reeves was reported in the FT today, um, sort of a tenuous line in there about sort of being open to a pur purge of Corbyn supporters, whatever that means. Um, but I think, you know, as far as, you know, people, uh, you know, worried MPs in the campaign group might see it or people around Starmer who are, who think an organised left is an impediment to, um, to his leadership, right? That's an analysis I think everybody in the party shares that a well organized left is an impediment to any effort by Keir Starmer or the PLP or anybody else to move the party away from the 10 pledges. Um, you know, their view is well, if they don't like it, the left will purge themselves as they were. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I know that's a worry of people on the left that left wing members are leaving. I know that silently or not so silently behind closed doors, some people close to this leadership or who support this leadership might say, brilliant, if you don't like it, leave. You know, I think the, the view of some people would be, well, it's already happening. So we don't need to wage this war. Um, the withdrawal is and the retreat, retreat is already happening. Well, Patrick's probably there to provided a more persuasive argument to stay in the Labour Party than um, James managed, in fact, because the people who really want you to leave uh, are not your friends. <laughs> James, yours was fine as well. I'm just saying, I think, I think Patrick, that was quite an emotive sort of finish um, to the conversation. Um, James, Dawn, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, Navara Media is going to be back at 8pm for another TWT crossover. This is for a quiz this evening. Um, but finally, I want to say um, thank you to the World Transform for putting on this virtual conference. It is a shame not to be there in person. I did love the opportunity to to meet the Navarra Media Tisky Sour audience um, at our, our proper live events, proper in real life events um, at previous conferences. But I think they've kept the spirit alive. And finally, Navarra Media, the World Transformed, both organizations that rely on the support of their donors, their subscribers. Um, so please um, do check out both of those websites. Go to theworldtransformed.org. You can see what else they're putting on during this conference. Great program. Um, and yeah, get your wallets out for both. Um, we'll be back at 8 p.m. And um, thanks again to all of my guests. Good night. Good night.